So friends, welcome to episode four of our story series on photoelectric effect. Last time we talked about uh, Halvak's experiment to qualitatively show that yes, when ultraviolet uh, radiation falls on a metallic surface, the electrons or or yeah, that time electron world was not there, but essentially there is charge created and. Uh, those things were done and we had done an experiment to kind of replication of uh, Halvox experiment and now today our hero will be a very very joint personality and that is J.J. J. Thompson, right? Sir J.J. J. Thompson is such a big name, everyone knows it's a general knowledge not only science students, even um, normal audience also know that uh, he was the person who discovered electron and that was year 1897 okay so before that atom was the final uh, smallest unit and uh, people believed that okay this is the last there is no subdivision of that but then uh, the series of experiments by J.J. Thompson and in continuation with uh, what other scientists had been doing for long and that was studying conduction of electricity in gases at low pressure. So those, uh, the whole thing culminated finally in 1897 when uh, uh, Thompson declared from his experimental data that all materials, all atoms have uh, tiny tiny particles in it which have negative charge, which have mass and then he also measured E by M and all those things uh, and established that inside atoms also you have structure. You have negatively charged particles which are very light as compared to the lightest atom that is hydrogen. Again, okay, so these tiny particles had uh, mass apparently some uh, 1800 times smaller than uh, the smallest, uh, lightest atom and these uh, particles which he called corpuscles, they were part of all the materials, all the materials, so that was a big discovery. So if I go a little bit in that history, uh, it starts with let us say Crookes, right, Crookes tube. Crookes was the person who used to make uh, varieties of, uh, of glass chambers and is known as uh, Crookes tube and the basic elements in the Crookes tube are you have some cathode, you have some cathode is a metal electrode and this is connected to the negative terminal of a, a, a large potential difference and then you have an ore somewhere you, you have anode somewhere, let's say somewhere here you have anode and uh, then you have uh, some from somewhere you have to pump out the air, so going to vacuum pump, going to vacuum pump from where you can reduce the pressure and so on. So when you reduce the pressure and apply high voltage between cathode and anode, then what you see is varieties of colors, first varieties of colors appear inside this tube. But if you go on reducing the pressure, finally everything becomes dark and all colors go on. Right? So that's a separate thing. But, but everything is dark here, but this part of the glass, this part of the glass, that shines greenish. This part opposite to this uh, cathode here that uh, shines greenish known as a fluorescence. So, if I talk in today's terminology, remember I'm talking the history, the story is uh, much before uh, the electron discovery or those carpuscles as uh, J. J. Thompson named that in, in his experiment before that, right, some 20 years before the 1870s or so, this uh, Crookes was there to study all the conduction of electricity in this low pressure environment, low pressure air or low pressure gas. So you have whatever is the residual gas here, so 
So some ionization is there, some electrons are there, some positive ions are there and because of this electric field, those positive ions will go this side and hit this cathode with large velocities because of the large mass and then uh, electrons will be emitted from here. So they are, they are the main component. You do have electrons from the, that gas also a little bit, little bit. But the uh, main component is electrons are ejected from this and these electrons go and hit this uh, glass surface here and uh, there you have some uh, excitation of uh, this, this uh, electrons in this material and from there that greenish greenish color is there. Alright, so in those times, in 1870s and 1880s, the, uh, this electron etc. was not in the mind. So people thought that something is emitted from here and uh, some people thought that it is some kind of uh, radiation, some kind of light, invisible light. We, we do not see light. We see using light, but we do not see light. Similarly, this is invisible. So something like uh, waves, uh, and that time waves in ether like light. So that was one uh, group, one one thought. Another thought was that no, there are massive particles, and there are particles which are emitted, and then they are coming here, right? So variation of this Crookes tube was, uh, was was the main thing, and the very famous picture you might have seen in textbooks. That if you put a cross here, some kind of a cross here, if you put some kind of a of a material here, then on this other side, on this other side, on this part of the glass, you will have a shadow of the same shape. You will have a shadow of the same same shape, right? And that part of the glass, uh, there is a darkness on uh, there, and the remaining thing is greenish. So on that greenish platform you have a shadow. So something is going in straight lines and casting shadow. <laughs> so these kind of uh, experiments were extended by uh, J.J. Thompson and then uh, he found that yes, these things which are coming here, they can be deflected by electric field and deflected by magnetic field. So people were trying to study this before Thomson also, but then uh, magnetic deflection they could see, but electric field deflection was difficult to see, right? And then uh, uh, this uh, J.J. Thomson found that, okay, people failed to see the deflection by electric field because there was enough, enough air here or enough gas here, the pressure was not that low. And then that uh, got analyzed, that became conducting and that shielded this, like, this uh, cathode ray beams uh, from being deflected and so on so on. So when he reduced the pressure to very low values, he found that it can be deflected by electric field. It can be deflected by magnetic field. And then from the calculations, he, he established that it has certain charge and certain mass and from that experiment an E by M could be calculated and that was the characteristic of, uh, of those corpuscles. So changing the gas, changing the cathode material, uh, these, uh, this E by M was all the time same and from there it was established that okay all atoms do have inside uh, uh, these kind of particles, identical particles, the whole of the world and all the materials and so on and so forth and that was later named as electrons. So that is J.J. Thompson. When uh, Hirsch did his experiments on electromagnetic waves and as a side result found that okay ultraviolet uh, radiation when falls on uh, metal then uh, these sparks are easier to do and therefore the conduction increases and therefore some negative charges uh, are there so that photoelectric effect and then uh, Hull Vox and Hirsch himself and certain other scientists also performed that and J.J. Thompson also did that he also did a separate experiment and then uh, showed that okay if you shine ultraviolet light on, light on this don't apply any voltage but uh, shine ultraviolet 
on this uh, cathode and again those cathode rays are emitted with the same E by M ratio, right? So that is how he also confirmed photoelectric effect, yes, uh, by shining UV light on cathode, electrons are ejected from there. Okay, so these experiments that I have described by Thomson, these were performed in the year 1899 and that is two years after that uh, so-called discovery of electrons where he showed that uh, cathode rays which were known for a very long time are nothing but streams of particles having certain charge and certain mass and the ratio of E by M or M by E that he has calculated uh, in his uh, 1897 paper and uh, very carefully designed experiment and this Crookes tube is uh, the kind of starting point that I have just mentioned for each piece of uh, that experimental work in 1897 and also 1899 for each piece of that research work he has designed a new vacuum tube okay corresponding to the requirement of uh, that piece of research so excellent uh, uh, design and excellent fabrication and then excellent uh, performing experiment. So the first observation of photoelectric effect was made by Hirsch in 1887 when he was trying to generate uh, electromagnetic waves in the laboratory and then uh, Hirsch himself made a full-fledged uh, experiment uh, to confirm this using again spark gaps and shining light on that and in 1888 Hallwax did the uh, experiments to confirm what Hertz had observed in his uh, 1887 experiment and uh, J.J. Thompson's experiments that uh, I had described were in 1899 two years after he had established that cathode rays are nothing but uh, electrons which are only present in all materials okay now i should mention uh, at least one more scientist a russian physicist who had done uh, experiments on photoelectric effect in 1888 itself so that that is our another character of the story m a Tolly Tolly. The, the name, the, the last letter here is uh, V that uh, I see everywhere, but in that uh, paper which is published in 1888, this is W. So I go with the majority and write it to V here. Now he was a Russian physicist and he also did a simple experiment on photoelectric effect uh, in 1888 but that was a bit more quantitative let me first describe his uh, apparatus he had taken uh, two metal plates and circular discs of uh, radius some 22 cm or so and placed them face to face now one of the disc was a solid disc and another was not a disc as such but it was a wire mesh. So this is that uh, solid disc, this is that solid disc and then in front of it another uh, disc which is actually conducting wires, these kind of wires, wire mesh like that. And then uh, he connects this to uh, battery, alright, and battery he makes uh, that just copper zinc type of uh, battery, Daniel cells, but then uh, two plates, three plates, four plates, many plates, hundred plates, and so on. So varies that. So this is cathode, the solid one is cathode, and this is anode. So the negative terminal of the battery will be connected here, and the positive terminal will go to this through. A very sensitive galvanometer. 
a static galvanometer we see and the sensitivity is of the order of say some 10 power minus 11 amperes also. So when galvanometer deflects one can measure how many divisions it is going and from there one can measure the current. Then he shines uh, you will light on this using, using an arc arc uh, lamp. Alright, so let us say this is arc lamp and it gives you light which has UV component. Of course, other lights will be there. So this is arc, right? This is arc lamp. So this is a kind of setup. This is the kind of setup. This uh, circuit is open here, air in between and uh, no vacuum or other thing is, is, uh, is reported. So it's uh, again a simple setup. What he finds is this light goes through these gaps and falls on this material, on this uh, metal, on this disc, solid disc, which is uh, the cathode, which is placed at a negative potential with respect to this. And then uh, when this arc shines and the light falls on this, you have a current. That's the photo current. This arc has some UV component and that UV component falls here and then uh, there is a current. Now we are calling UV, UV, UV all the time. It doesn't mean that only ultraviolet can cause this, this kind of emission of electrons from here. Right? It all depends on what metal it is. Generally, the metals which are used in these experiments have uh, this character that visible light is not able to eject electrons from here. We will talk more about it once we complete this uh, series and then we go to the Einstein's explanation. There we will talk more about uh, all these properties. Nevertheless, this observation was there and then he studies several things. He studied several things. In this particular piece of experiment that was reported in 1888, he has uh, done several things. One is that putting a screen here, putting a screen here, putting some kind of shield here, right? Some kind of shield. So you find that if it is an opaque sheet, of course, the entire light is blocked, everything is blocked, it's opaque and then there is no current or negligible current but uh, then he puts varieties of glasses varieties of glasses so the light is going but even then uh, the current is very very minimal and then when he puts squash then he finds a very significant current so we have already talked about it, quartz does not absorb UV, right, quartz does not absorb UV, normal glass will absorb it and therefore normal glass, although it is transparent, it will stop UV and uh, since uh, this metal here is not appropriate for ejecting electrons with a visible light, there is uh, almost no current. So that was one thing that UV light is uh, is needed to, to take those electrons away or to create that charge. Okay, 1988, uh, the, the terminology should not use electron as such. Okay, so that was one observation. Then uh, the second observation was on, uh, he blocked part of the surface of this disk. He blocked part of the surface of this disk and exposed only the remaining part and found that yes, the current is proportionately diminished. So that's another part. And then the third part was that uh, separation, separation between these plates L. So he studied the current, what uh, the dependence on the current on this separation. If you increase the separation, what happens here? So he says that uh, the current decreases as L is increased, current decreases. That one can understand very uh, in a simple way, but not inversely proportional. And this I is something like E divided by A plus B L. This what is the E is that this this EMF which is applied across the this capacitor. Right. So that is another set of. Uh, results that he says 
Then he talks of dependence on the current on this EMF E. So that's a, a very significant part. Uh, if you increase this EMF, and that he has done by putting several plates in that uh, battery, and uh, so if you increase this E, how does the current go? So that for that he says that okay, initially it uh, when E is small. When this EMF is small, then initially it is almost proportional, it increases, right, proportionately. But once uh, it assumes uh, some larger value, after that the rate of increase of current is uh, slowed down. So he has not shown any graph, but if I show on a graph it will be like if this is E, this is E, then uh, it will be something like this and then it taps. That we know, that we know when we do, I will talk more about this. If you increase this, uh, this EMF here, then uh, the current finally saturates. We will talk about it. Finally saturates, so it is going towards that. So these are the observations in one particular paper which I could find uh, in English. There are three or four or maybe more papers uh, in the same year or a year later on photoelectric effect where he must have uh, measured other things but those are not at least I could not find them in uh, English could not understand they are in French uh, and so but then something called uh, Stoletov's law of photoelectric effect okay and that must have come from those uh, those researches that he has done and that is this current is proportional to intensity. Intensity of this light, this UV light, right? So intensity of this uh, uh, the source. In this experiment also, he has uh, taken different materials to produce this arc, and has established that okay, aluminium is the best. It gives largest current, and other materials are giving. Uh, different kinds of current. So it depends on what material you are using because different materials will give different wavelength distribution of UV and therefore the current will depend on that. So maybe he has studied it more systematically and uh, has established that the photo current, this current here is proportional to the intensity of the light that is falling on that and this is sometimes called the uh, uh, Stolikov-Tobes uh, first law. Okay, now this is significant. Uh, I, I chose this one uh, one because uh, it uh, I came across it, so that was one. And second thing is, Hutz has done just uh, he has mentioned that it is there, and even his next paper where he has uh, uh, done on this uh, done this research on this part only there also he has not made much of. Uh, of data collection, quantitative data collection. He is uh, busy in showing that yes, the spark length uh, increases, decreases uh, on, the, on this UV and the length of the spark little bit gives uh, indication but measurements are, are still missing. Hallmarks of course, uh, there's no measurements uh, but this one, uh, they are all 1988 uh, and even that uh, Thomson paper of uh, 1899. There also the main focus is that these uh, charges which are uh, which are generated when ultraviolet falls on a metal, so those are same as cathode rays. Okay, the main focus was on that. He is measuring uh, electronic charge e, e by m and then showing that okay the cathode rays which he had been studying for so long the values of the parameters there and the values of parameters for these charges which are coming out of metal on UV shining, they are the same. So the main focus on that. So in that uh, reference, this particular Stolitov's uh, result where quantitatively he is measuring things and giving results is, uh, is a good contribution in the story <laughs> all right so that is uh, it and then uh, maybe next episode we will we will talk of uh, another giant personality 
1905 Nobel Prize awardee Philip Leonard. It has uh, given uh, a very good quantitative results. And uh, Einstein in his Nobel Prize work has mentioned about this.